Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, with page two of the mail and a crunch meeting for Theresa May uh, at Chequers. It, it, it's time to get going on Brexit, she appears to be signalling. Yes. Well, yes, there's a back to school cabinet meeting. It's funny how, as soon as you have a strong woman in charge, all this kind of headmistress, head prefect stuff kind of. Th there is know, a sexist tone to all of this, isn't there? There is. But um, anyway, she is going to be um, addressing the cabinet and. Um, uh, making it clear that uh, Brexit is her top priority and this is uh, of course one of the agendas we have to remember is it's not just about the country having voted for Brexit it is about she has got at the moment if she chooses not to have a snap election which many people think she should but assuming she doesn't she still has a very narrow majority and she has some very restive backbenchers so mm. she needs to keep them happy and she needs to send very strong signals saying you know we are yeah. doing this we are making the best of it we are going for it and that's what she's going to do yeah it's not it's not entirely clear whether the banging heads together over Brexit is a metaphor I quite like it if she did mm. no I I wouldn't, I wouldn't. No, no, no. <laughs> but I mean, in a way, it's about the uh, the three Brexiteers, Davis, Johnson and Dr Fox. Fox, that they're jostling for position about who's going to take the lead role in what is a huge body of work that is going to need to be done to disentangle ourselves from the European Union. The other thing that she's got on her agenda is civil servants trying to thwart it. And Gus O'Donnell today, uh, former cabinet secretary, who used to get called, apparently, God, mm. G-O-D, because he's so bright and omniscient. He gave an interview in today's Times saying that he didn't think that Brexit was a done deal, we could have a second referendum. And she, she's clearly thinking, come back from holiday, get people on board, we need to get moving on this. I mean, doesn't, doesn't Theresa May just simply recognise, as we were talking last hour, that the political reality of the situation? 52% of mm. those who voted, voted for Brexit. Mm. Brexit has to happen. Mm. And giving any indication uh, that there might be a pause, that there might be a, a let-up of the, the work that's currently going on in Whitehall, it sends entirely the wrong mm. message uh, to those who voted to leave. I think that's absolutely right. Mm. I, I think the trouble is that people don't know, I mean, people don't know what Brexit is. And um, as we said before, the the three Brexiteers have very different visions of it and indeed yeah. didn't even have visions of it. They just vaguely knew that they wanted to leave the EU but they didn't know what form that would take. So I think I think Gus O'Donnell is wrong. I don't think, um, I think there is no question that you can't ignore the views of 52% of the population even if it wasn't at all clear what they were voting for. You have to try and work out what they thought they were voting for and yeah. deliver that which is why I think that all of these single market options are completely off the table because I think if the British, if those 52% voted for anything, it was probably not freedom of movement. And I think that's what Theresa May feels she has to act on. Beyond that, I think it's sort of all up for grabs at the moment, actually. Mm, still, I mean, as the last paragraph of this story makes clear, you know, IDS, Ian Duncan Smith leading the calls from the back bench for Mrs May to, to, to enact Article 50 as soon as possible. Plenty of people who voted for Brexit are calling for Article 50 uh, to be enacted as soon as possible. The reason one, one presumes is because people like Gus O'Donnell and yep. others are suggesting <laughs> that Brexit might not quite happen in the way that you think it might. And that is building uncertainty, and I think Theresa May wants to get rid of that. And that actually brings us on to the second story because on the uh, financial page of the Mail on Sunday they're talking about a post-referendum boom um, in contradistinction to what people thought would happen uh, three different stories on this page one is about uh, 30 to 40,000 new jobs posted on a recruitment company's website they're also mentioning that um, uh, there's year-on-year -year rises in new jobs in education construction property Although this is a mixed picture, jobs are down in training, apprenticeships and, not surprisingly, uh, banking. Um, there's also been a boom in, in the tourist industry here because of staycation, the falling pound, expensive foreign holidays and but so on. But of course, you get, yeah, exactly. So you can argue that, yeah. that, is a, yeah. that, that that's well, not necessarily a good thing, is it? But I mean, I suppose the point is that this is the reflection of market sentiment about what it will be like when the uh, Brexit... But we but actually don't know. But it's not yeah, true. We don't know. Exactly, exactly. And, and actually there are lots of other economic indicators that right. are not nearly as positive as this. But we have not left the EU yet. This has not taken into account all the changes in tariffs. And the reality is that prices are likely to go up considerably when the, we leave the EU. And they're, 
the Bank of England has predicted a lot of job losses and I've heard of a number of people already who've had contracts and jobs cut because of this decision. So we don't know, but I don't think we can, I think you know, if the fact that there's a sort of vague sense of yeah. buoyancy at the moment doesn't make any predictions about, give any indications of how things are going to look when we do finally kind of disentangle this very complex net. I mean, we, we were discussing this the, the, before we came on air, but the, you know, the, the, the Mail on Sunday, slight change in tone Absolutely. as regards Brexit, yes. you know, Theresa May uh, pushing hard, let's get this, this done. I mean, doesn't all of that suggest that there is, a, there is a recognition now that people, including many of those who voted Remain, have just said, look, the public has made up its mind. We've had that referendum. It is now time just to deal with the reality and just move on. We've got to, we've got to make it work. And I think psychologically for us as a nation, we've got to get closure on that so that we can start building the alliances, our place in the world, the economic agreements, uh, persuading companies to invest in us. I think th the, the constant harping on, as you say, about whether this is going to mean Brexit, then obviously we don't know precisely what it's going to look like yet, but the fact that we are going to leave the EU, that gives us an opportunity. I, I voted Remain, but I do think we can still be a great nation in the world. Uh, well, the, the oh, indications sorry. are that economically we are not going to be nearly as great a nation in the world, but we'll have to see. Obviously, you know, I, I agree now that this decision has been made, we have to make the best of it, no question. But I also don't think it's, you know, that you should say to people who voted Remain, not that you are saying that, but people do say this, oh, but you mustn't be downbeat, because actually there will be economic prices to, to be paid, and we don't yet know what those are. Page two of The Sun, and, uh, you know, uh, for viewers who are uh, getting slightly annoyed about uh, the constant uh, reference to Brexit, Exit stories. Sorry, uh, you know, You're referendum. Welcome to the next five years of your life. Yeah, exactly. At the very least. W what's the What's the story here, though? Um, I mean, we keep asking this question: What does Brexit mean for the majority of people who voted to leave the European Union? It was I want an end to membership of the European Union and an end to freedom of movement. Mm. Uh, are they likely to get both of those? Well, we were saying before, weren't we? It's either political suicide or economic suicide. If you don't stop free movement, people are going to be pretty annoyed in this country because that felt like that was the condition on which they voted in the referendum and obviously if you do come out of the uh, the single market it's going to be a long hard road for the next five or six years and Theresa May knows that so, so it's catch 22. So what will they what will they do but I mean and the remaining campaigners because you know they're now in a position if you campaign for Ram Remain what do you now do well they've created an institution called Open Britain which urges the, per the PM not to pull up the drawbridge, but to secure, this is what really frustrates me, to secure the best possible trade deals with Brussels. It's such an easy thing to say, you know what I think we should do? I've thought about this. Why don't we secure the best possible trade deals with Brussels? That's like, a great idea. Oh, God, yeah, that's a really good idea. Why don't we, you know, why, the fact that we've not done that for the preceding 20 years within the European Union makes it very hard to believe with any great confidence that we'll do it when we come out of the European Union. And they've got to start somewhere, and they're starting from scratch because no one in the government decided to do any planning for this. There is no contingency for Brexit. And we now have Theresa May next week having a cabinet meeting where she's going to be saying in the manner of a schoolmistress to ask people whether they did their projects over the summer. Right then, guys, what does Brexit mean for your department? And they'll all do what I did this summer. I sat in my office and I've come up with my thoughts about Brexit. And it's kind of funny if it wasn't so serious because we've had this massive decision and it's now in the hands of a bunch of politicians, some of which believe in parts of it, some of whom believe in all of it. And it's quite hard to say what, who is going to be creating this environment for the best possible trade deals with Brussels. This is kind of the point, though, isn't it? Because I don't feel like I really understand what the Conservative position on Brexit is right now. There's not really any unity within the party. I mean, perhaps we'll find out in the coming weeks when this all kicks off. But, but do, do you understand why, and, and, and certainly this is, the, this, this is from the correspondence we receive here at Sky News, why so many people who voted for Brexit are starting to get annoyed? Their starting point for this is... You know, enact Article 50, let's get the ball rolling, let's at least know within two years we are not going to be members of the EU and the rest of the detail will work it out as you go. The problem, with that, the problem with that argument, which is a perfectly understandable argument, is because the system isn't designed to allow people to leave. So if you enact Article 50, you start the ball rolling, you're basically putting a gun to the head of the negotiators on our side to make this deal happen. If the deal doesn't happen, you then revert to all sorts of basic 
uh, agreements with Europe which are very detrimental to the British economy. So actually, it's a real risk. You could only enact Article 50 if you have confidence you can turn around a negotiation within two years. So as you say, it's a catch-22 because you can't really get progress until you enact Article 50. Mm. But you don't want to enact Article 50 until you get progress. So meanwhile, you have people looking at each other around the cabinet table saying, well, I want a good deal. Do you want a good deal? Yeah, I'd like a good deal. Would you like a good deal? Yeah, we'd all like a good deal. So Theresa May says Brexit means Brexit which, like all confident proclamations, kind of sounds good, but of course admits an emptiness at the heart of it, because she can't say Brexit means something. She only has to say, well, it means Brexit, it means what it is. And we're in the position of having not just Theresa May, but David Davis, Liam Fox and Boris Johnson, Boris four Johnson. big beasts, mm. all involved to some extent in the negotiating process. Yeah, you did with, miss one key factor, was, was Boris Johnson is our foreign secretary. Yeah. So we can't fail we can't at fail. this point. <laughs> well, Because he's never, had any, he's never put his foot in his mouth or anything like that. But uh, it's interesting, though, because one of the big uh, Brexit arguments prior to the referendum was that Europe buys so much from us uh, in terms of services and other things things that we're going to be in this really strong position when it comes to negotiations. So you've obviously got the Vice Chancellor in Germany saying, you know, you're going to be punished. But is that, is that the case? Are they able to do that? If, are, are they willing to lose, um, you know, the amount of uh, money that comes from the UK into yeah. the what, EU? What, what's in their interest? I mean, it's an interesting point. What's in the EU's interest? Do they want us to, to walk away happily or do they want to walk away with a tail between our legs? And, and that will be a factor as well. I've been